This is TED Health. I'm Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Do you have a difficult time expressing your thoughts? Do you ever wish people could simply read your mind? Well, neurologist Tom Oxley talks us through a breakthrough technology that does precisely that. A new brain implant promises to help paralyzed and other disabled people communicate simply by thinking. And after, I'll discuss a less high-tech but very effective method that's helped millions of people who can't hear communicate. You won't want to miss it. A few months ago, I surrendered the password to my Twitter account to let a person with paralysis tweet out their thoughts. But I mean that literally. Philip O'Keefe can't use his fingers to type like you or I, but thanks to a tiny brain implant, he was able to send the following tweets. Hello, world. Short tweet. Monumental progress. No need for keystrokes or voices. I created this tweet just by thinking it. My hope is that I pave the way for people to be able to tweet through thoughts. Phil. Now, you might be thinking there are some people out there who should not be allowed to tweet directly from their brain. <laughs> I agree. But for people with paralysis and disability, this technology can be life-changing. I'm very excited to introduce you to Philip and Rodney. They both have a neurodegenerative disease called ALS. It means they can't move their hands or speak clearly. But they can now text thanks to a brain-computer interface, or BCI. They will fill up brain signals up on the screen. They're connected to their computers via Bluetooth. The device is fully internalized, invisible to the outside world. And they learn to control the keyboard with clicks directly coming from their brain. Now, BCIs conjure up images of science fiction like The Matrix, with a cable jacked up into your brain through a hole in your skull. But I'm here to show you that the future can be much more elegant than that. So we got this group chat going, which I thought was a great idea until they started roasting me about the TED Talk, <laughs> which they found hilarious. Thanks for the vote of confidence, guys. Bloody Australians. <laughs> Now, you can see it's still quite slow for them to type this way, but this is like dial-up speeds at the beginning of the internet. This has been the dream of patients and caregivers, doctors and scientists for decades, and for good reason. You may know someone who's lost the ability to use their hands, maybe from a stroke or a spinal cord injury or multiple sclerosis, paralysis. It comes in all shapes and sizes, from minor inconvenience to life-threatening. During my neurology residency, I cared for a man in his 40s. He had a stroke and developed locked-in syndrome. Many couldn't move his body, except for his eyes, left or right. He could see and hear and think and feel just like normal, but he couldn't move or speak ever again. And in what were horrific circumstances, we supported his wish to be taken off life support. And so I've been wondering ever since, was there not anything else that could have been done? Connection is a fundamental human need. So many of our patients have lost the ability to speak, let alone type, for years. And they so desperately want to reconnect with their family, with their loved ones. You know what the main request we get is? Text messaging. And then email, control over their smartphone. And, shock horror, social media. And we've been speaking so much lately about the flaws of these technologies, but for people with paralysis, this is a return to life. The BCIs make all of this possible. Now, part of the problem has been that BCIs typically require invasive surgery. This is the Utah array. This is designed similarly to all other BCIs currently under development, which require drilling needles directly into the brain. Now, this has been the basis of critical fundamental research over the last 20 years, and the early proof that this technology really can perform. But for patients, it means open brain surgery, which involves cutting through the skull with a saw. And there are only about 150 functional neurosurgeons in the U.S. that can perform this procedure. Apart from the fact that the recovery is tricky, 
the brain doesn't really like having needles put into it. It develops this foreign body tissue rejection immune reaction over time. So I've been wondering, is there any other way into the brain? And there is a secret back door. The blood vessels are the natural highways into the brain. These are hollow tubes that connect every corner of the brain. The largest vein is right next to the motor cortex, the exact part of the brain that we want to connect to to restore control to the outside world. Now, we already know how to travel through the blood vessels. We've been doing it for 40 years, mostly going to the heart. If anyone here today has had a heart attack, there's a pretty good chance you've had a stent. A stent is a metal scaffold delivered through a catheter, which opens up like a flower into the blood vessel. Millions of stents are delivered each year, not in the OR, but in the cath lab or catheter laboratory. It's now common in the cath lab to navigate up into the brain through the blood vessels. And there are two and a half thousand physicians who can now navigate their way up into the brain. But what's really amazing about this is that for BCIs, we already know that devices can be left inside a blood vessel, cells grow over it, incorporate it into the wall like a tattoo under the skin, and we're protected from that immune reaction. This is part of the reason why our team became the first in the world to receive a green light from the FDA to conduct clinical trials of a permanently implanted BCI. So what we had to do was figure out a way to put a sensor connected to the cross links of the stent that could record that brain activity. But to do that, we had to do a complete overhaul of stent manufacturing. Then connect it to a cable which brings the information out of the brain and do it all in a way that it can be delivered in the cath lab. This way, we can make BCI accessible not to the thousands of people, but to the millions of people who need this technology. Graham Felstead, an incredible human being, suffering with ALS, became the first person in the world to receive and use one of these brain-computer interfaces. I was standing in the cath lab. Dr. Peter Mitchell had just completed the surgery. It just felt like we were witnessing something new in the world. I had tingles down my spine. I've got them now thinking about it again. I turned to my colleague, Pete, and I said something poetic and profound, like, Pete, holy shit. <laughs> and then two hours later, something even more amazing happened. Graham woke up and he asked, am I alive? And our nurse, Christine, broke out in tears of relief. It was, it was a phenomenal moment. Once it's in place, it's connected to this tiny antenna that sits under the skin in the chest. This collects the raw brain data and sends it out of the body wirelessly to then connect with external devices. It's always on and ready to go, kind of like how your brain is meant to work. So here's how it works. Our engineers work with our patients to decode specific movements. So we tell the patient, press down your foot. So they'll repeatedly press down their foot. And we can, you, know, you won't see the foot moving because they're paralyzed. But we've been able to determine which brain signals are generally linked to press down your foot. Now, we repeat this for several different types of movements, say, open, close your hand or pinch or grip your finger. Now, that may not seem like much, but these become the building blocks for every single interaction on a digital device that is needed for control. Converted to click, up, down, left, right, menu, back, etc. But what's really amazing is that to some degree, this process, our brain signals are universal. So the brain signal for press down your foot for me is the same as it is for you. Now, this means that we're creating a dictionary of the brain across all humans. This is going to make BCI truly scalable. As Philip once said to me, it's kind of like learning how to ride a bike. It takes a bit of practice, but once you're rolling, it becomes natural. Now I just look on the screen where I want to click, and I'm texting, messaging the world via Twitter. But Graham, he said, as his ALS was progressing, that it gave him immense comfort to know that even if his body was failing, 
he was always going to be able to tell his wife that he loved her. In the future, I'm really excited about the breakthroughs BCI could deliver to other conditions like epilepsy, depression, and dementia. But beyond that, what is this going to mean for humanity? What's really got me thinking is the future of communication. Take emotion. Have you ever considered how hard it is to express how you feel? You have to self-reflect, package the emotion into words, and then use the muscles of your mouth to speak those words. But you really just want someone to know how you feel. For some people with certain conditions, that's impossible. So what if, rather than using your words, you could throw your emotion just for a few seconds? And have them really feel how you feel. At that moment, we would have realized that the necessary use of words to express our current state of being was always going to fall short. The full potential of the brain would then be unlocked. But for right now, BCI is about restoring the lives of millions of people with paralysis after years of feeling trapped. This technology promises the return of autonomy and independence, but what I really mean is dignity. Thank you. Hey, listeners. This is Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter again. Tom Oxley said that connection is a fundamental human need, and it's true. That's why solitary confinement is considered such a harsh punishment. Because communication is critical to human thriving, and there's an amazing example of this, one that's far lower tech but just as important as Tom Oxley's brain implants, sign language. We all intuitively know that communication and connection are critical to our well-being, but the history of sign language shows us just how critical, because it wasn't until sign language was enshrined as an official language. That the deaf and hard of hearing community finally got the recognition they always deserved. Today, over 70 million people use sign language, and there's more than 300 different sign languages across the globe. Beyond the deaf community, people with developmental or speech-related disabilities, like autism or mutism, may use sign language to communicate with the people around them. And even children between the ages of six and nine months can start to use sign language to communicate their needs and desires with guardians. American Sign Language, or ASL, is the third most studied language at colleges and universities in the U.S. But sign language hasn't always been widely available or even accepted. It took hundreds of years for society to recognize that sign language is, in fact, necessary, and the people who need it had to fight for it. Modern sign language began in Spain. Pedro Ponce de Leon, a 16th-century Benedictine monk, is the first person credited as being the first teacher of the deaf. Around 1760, the French priest Abbe Charles Michel de la Paix opened the very first public school for deaf children. Pupils from all across France attended and brought the signs they used at home. De la Paix incorporated the children's signs into his own sign language and then standardized every part of it. Nearly 60 years after De la Paix founded his school, Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet went to France to train under De la Paix's successor to bring these innovations back to the U.S. And in 1817, Gallaudet helped to establish the American School for the Deaf in Hartford, Connecticut. The signs Gallaudet learned in France, combined with another dialect that arose on Martha's Vineyard. Make up the base of modern-day ASL. Over time, organizations like the National Association of the Deaf helped to popularize the use of sign language, and it wasn't long before sign language became essential for the deaf community and their hearing loved ones. But only some people approved. Many others believed that practicing it was inferior to speaking. Among them, Alexander Graham Bell, known for inventing the telephone. He adamantly supported oralism, or teaching the deaf to read lips and speak instead of sign language. Then, in 1880, it all came crashing down for the deaf community. During an international conference of deaf educators in Italy, known as the Milan Conference, 
educators banned sign language from schools for the deaf. They officially declared that oralism was better for the deaf than sign language. This decision lowered the quality of life for the deaf and hard of hearing, who were sometimes inhumanely forced to learn to speak. Advocates like linguist William Stokey, a longtime professor at Gallaudet University, campaigned for decades for a reversal. Stokey even wrote a thesis proving that sign language is a valid and necessary language fighting for its use in deaf education. Finally, in 1960, sign language was recognized as an official language. And in 1965, the ban on teaching sign language was reversed. In the context of the civil rights movement, this reversal was the catalyst for fostering diversity, equity, and inclusion among these communities. Among the deaf and hard of hearing communities, sign language is not only a tool that enables much needed human connection and belonging, it's considered a fundamental human right through which they can access all other basic human rights. Schools must provide sign language interpreters to deaf students. Public officials have their live messages translated into sign. That language, the ability to connect and communicate, proved a watershed for showing the hearing world that the deaf deserve a place at every table. Today, we're much closer to the goal of total inclusion, but far from the mark, with many deaf people worldwide still unable to access fundamental human rights. And while the presence of interpreters has grown more commonplace, particularly since COVID live broadcasts, many places continue to exclude people who can't hear or speak by failing to provide interpreters in critical times of need, like medical emergencies. Thankfully, there's so much we can do to take action ourselves. Sign language is relatively easy to start learning because many signs are commonplace gestures. They're fun to practice and easy to remember. You might recall from earlier that even babies can communicate with their families using sign language. A good first step might be learning to fingerspell, that is, learning to sign the ABCs, as this can rapidly open doors of communication and bring us all closer to forging those human connections that we need to thrive. Thanks so much for listening today. This episode was produced by Joanne DeLuna and fact-checked by Ted. And special thanks to Anna Phelan, Maria Lagius, Michelle Quint, Grace Rubenstein, and Colin Helms. I'm Dr. Shoshana Ungerleiter. Stay well, and I'll talk to you next week.